Well, I'm going to talk about energy efficiency in Mexico and the efforts that have been done there. And um, first, this has been said already by Paul and others, but uh, about 70% of the potential for CO2 abatement in 2020 comes from energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is really key for this problem. Most importantly, developing countries are where the demand is growing, which is what uh, Paul mentioned. And the growth in non-OECD countries is projected to be 85% compared to only 18% in non-developed -de countries. So, uh, and I found these numbers really striking. To support a global population of nine and a half billion people in 2050, we would need 16 times more energy. This is just quickly the structure of the Mexican energy sector. And the main thing that I want to highlight here is this, that is mostly public, so that companies are publicly owned. Electricity generation, like in most of the world, comes basically from fossil fuels, uh, as you can see there in those pies. And Mexico has been doing a lot in terms of energy efficiency through several programs and standards. As Catherine mentioned early, earlier in her talk, a really important challenge for Mexico and other countries is to end poverty and also keep the energy demand low. So there are limited resources and we need to use them in the best way to uh, confront this challenge. So uh, the previous administration in Mexico, in order to prioritize the investments on energy efficiency, we used an abatement cost curve. You're probably familiar with this because in the US, their, uh, McKinsey and company did one as well. So this is the one for Mexico, where basically they did a similar study that, than what they did in the US. And then from there, they uh, extracted only the energy efficiency measures for that. And as you can see, the main uh, opportunity, they said that was on lighting, and the second one on replacing old appliances. So that's where we focus our efforts. There was uh, Luz Sustentable, which was a progr program to replace inefficient light bulbs with efficient ones. And it has never been done like this ever in the world. It was really ambitious in terms of um, how long it lasted. It was really quick and it was really uh, broad also. We replaced almost 46 million light bulbs in just uh, less than a year. So we got the, as you can see there in the picture, we got the Guinness record. There's President Calderon receiving the Guinness record for this. And then there's a, another picture below when uh, I am at this event with some of the stars of a really famous soap opera in, in Mexico, a telenovela. Um, so this is what we did. People had to bring four old light bulbs, inefficient, and they would get four efficient light bulbs for free. They just had to bring a, an official ID and some other things so the, that we could keep track of who had already gotten their four light bulbs. And the calculation that we got from traditional methods, and this, this is going to make more sense after Luca's presentation, is that the benefits of this program were that each participant saved about $120 on their electricity bill. The government saved 100 $850,000 on avoided subsidies, and there were environmental benefits similar to uh, taking out of the market 600,000 cars. Uh, this program was also important from what came next, or almost at the same time. That was the standard for light bulbs, and now a lot of the inefficient light bulbs are prohibited or banned in Mexico that you cannot commercialize anymore. And this was also phased out from 2011 until uh, 2013. 
The second program, which is about the second bar that you saw in that uh, graph, was the appliance replacement program called Cambia Tu Viejo. Like in Spanish, people really like the name because it also means like change your old man. So uh, <laughs> it was used as a joke. But uh, I'm not going to talk about this program much because Lucas is going to uh, discuss it after me. And I want to also mention that I think it's really uh, sad that while we we're doing all this effort, or well, a lot of countries like Mexico are doing all these efforts in terms of energy efficiency. At the same time, we have large en energy subsidies that really give bad incentives for energy efficiency. In Mexico, there's energy subsidies for electricity, and these subsidies are higher in the summer, so they really subsidize air conditioning. We have subsidies for gasoline, and we have subsidies for LP gas, which is used mostly. Like in Mexico, there's, uh, we don't use natural gas much. So these subsidies are very regressive. In 2008, these energy subsidies were 10 times more than the cost of Oportunidades, which is the main poverty program. And it was four times the cost of all the poverty programs together. Gasoline. Uh, the, the subsidy was more than $16,000 million. And the residential electricity rate covers only 43% of the cost on average. And for agricultural rates, it's only 31%. And there, you know, we are not only encouraging wasting electricity, but also wasting water. So it's really terrible. The electricity subsidies to households are about $7,000 million. And there you can see a graph that is really nicely put by CIDA, which is a Mexican research institute. And you can see how regressive these subsidies are. You can see the different deciles and how much most of these subsidies are going to the rich or to the wealthiest decile. And sadly, Mexico is not alone. There are subsidies in a lot of different countries. And uh, I don't know if any of you have seen, but there's a new report by, by the IMF where they say that subsidies for energy are about 480 billion in 2011. This is about 0.7% of the global GDP. So what does Mexico need to do? First of all, transparent and targeted subsidies, I think that will be much more effective than any uh, energy efficiency program. We need to keep investing on energy efficiency, but we also really need to strengthen the evaluations that we do on energy efficiency programs and standards to get the most bang for the buck. And this um, also, Lucas is going to talk more about it. So thank you. OK, thank you, Veronica. So I'm. Uh, delighted to add to this. I feel, I feel like we've talked, some of these themes we've really have been building throughout the day. Uh, many of you, uh, many people have already said today that total energy demand is growing dramatically. So over the next several decades, total energy consumption is forecast to increase over 50%. Most of this is going to occur in low and middle income countries. And most of this is going to be met with fossil fuels. Now, uh, most economists, like myself, would like to see a carbon tax, would like to see, uh, see carbon and other externalities from energy use taxed or cap and trade program. Although there's some progress in this direction, in particular in California, most of the global emissions remain unpriced. Instead, one of the things that's gaining a lot of attention is energy efficiency. In the United States, we spend $5 billion a year on energy efficiency, and internationally, spending on energy efficiency is increasing. The World Bank has ramped up its energy efficiency spending, for example, now spends about $2 billion a year. Despite a lot of resources and attention on energy efficiency, we don't know a heck of a lot about what works and what doesn't work. So supporters of energy efficiency argue that it's a win-win, that it allows people to reduce energy expenditures while also reducing the externalities from energy use. A series of studies from the McKinsey Group that Veronica mentioned have doc documented um, so these have gotten a lot of attention, I think, primarily uh, because, so what is this? Many of you have seen the, the McKinsey curve. This is an abatement cost curve for carbon. 
And the reason these, these curves have, re have received so much, much attention, I'll turn this way since I don't have a screen anyway. Uh, the reason these have received so much attention, I think, is because of this mass of investments that come in with a negative net cost of, of investment. So taken literally, what this means is these are investments that would pay for themselves even before accounting for potential environmental benefits. McKinsey's identified that in middle-income countries like Mexico are some of the largest potential benefits. Here's the McKinsey curve for Mexico. And over the next 20 minutes, I want to spend a little bit of time working on, on, a, pro on a project I've been working on trying to drill in to one component of this McKinsey cost curve for Mexico, appliances. This Veronica already highlighted this component of, of, of the cost curve. Um, these are engineering estimates. So these are based on our best numbers for what, these different, what, what di uh, different technologies represent in terms of energy savings. They, some, they, they may fail to incorporate the full behavioral response to these investments. So that's some of the things we're going to hope to get at. It's a really interesting program. So we're looking at a national replacement program, uh, replacement, appliance replacement program that since 2009 has replaced one and a half million refrigerators and air conditioners. This is a cash for clunkers program. So you had, in order to participate in the program, you had to surrender your old appliance, and the old appliances were permanently destroyed. You, you had to buy a new appliance, had to meet energy efficiency standards, and actually exceed them by 5%. In exchange for upgrading your appliance, you could receive a cash subsidy of $30, $110, or $170. So we're going to look at this using household level electric billing data from the universe of Mexican residential customers. We've matched this with, with program data describing a million participants. For each participant, we know when they replace their appliance, the date of appliance, and the appliance type. Okay, so I first want to talk a little bit about participation behavior. So the question we want to get at here is, how does participation change with diff different subsidy amounts? And this, this goes to how would a program actually, in practice, go about realizing the potential gains identified by McKinsey? Um, so this is, a pretty, this is a pretty difficult question, it turns out, to try to des describe causally the, re the relationship between subsidy amount and technology take up. And the approach we're going to take is use, using what's called a regression discontinuity analysis. This is going to become super transparent in the next slide. But basically, basically the idea here is we, we don't have a randomized control trial. But by looking at narrow, narrowly in windows around eligibility thresholds, it's almost as if we did have a randomized control trial. Because within these narrow windows, households are going to be observationally equivalent. Here's the basic idea. The amount of the subsidy that you qualified for depended on how much electricity you consumed during the previous calendar year. For example, this is, the air, this is one of the discontinuities we look at for air conditioners. For households with, with consumption that was below 500 kilowatt hours per month in the previous year, these guys received $170. At exactly 500 kilowatt hours, this, this fell to 110. So, you can see where we're going with this. Basically, we're going to compare people who are right around this threshold, thinking that guys with average historical electricity consumption of 499 are ex ante pretty similar to guys who have average historical electricity consumption of 501. In, a, in an analysis like this, you might be concerned about pot potential manipulation. If there's something that these households could do in the program to somehow, uh, somehow affect where they were on these thre subsidy thresholds, that would be really bad um, from trying to, trying to tease out the causal relationship here. So in the paper, we have a lot of statistical tests that go into trying to tease this out. Um, the most intuitive, though, is just to look at how many customers we have with different levels of average historic electricity consumption. And if you thought that the households were able to manipulate this, you'd, you would see bunching. You'd see just on the, on the generous side of these different subsidy levels, you'd expect to see more households. And we don't see that. So moving on to the same main results for participation, I want to show two figures that just show the percent participation by average historical electricity consumption. So I haven't done any econometrics here. I haven't done any smoothing. I'm just showing average participation levels by three kilowatt hour bins. And so this actually ends up being pretty interesting. If your electricity consumption was very low, you were ineligible for the program. And, and happily, we find that none of, those none of those households participate. Our primary interest in this, though, is what happens at the threshold. And what you see is that, for example, here where the subsidy falls from 170 to 110, 
it looks like participation falls. When we estimate this with a regression model, it tells us it's about a 20% fall. When the subsidy falls from 110 to 30, air conditioning re uh, uh, replacement falls by about 40%. When then when the subsidy falls from 30 to zero, there's essentially no change. Ref refrigerators, the results are very similar, but they're more precisely estimated. When the subsidy falls from 170 to 110, participation falls. When it falls from 110 to 30, it falls. And again, basically no change when the subsidy changes from 30 to zero. So this is exactly what we expected, that more generous subsidies would, would lead to higher take up. What was real surprising to us, though, was how small the gain in participation was. So at these thresholds, you're not getting a lot of bang for your buck. In increasing the subsidy level, for example, from 110 to 170 is very expensive and only leads to about a 20% increase in participation. Turning now to energy savings. So what happens when these households got these appliances home? How much did they save? Well, how are we going to do this? We're going to go back to the same data and we're going to compare before and after using the, this electricity cons the consumption data. And basically we're going to be able to do month by month comparisons. So we're going to be able to look January to January, where in the first January you had the old appliance and the second January had the, the, the new appliance. What do we expect to find? Well, this program was motivated by engineering estimates from McKinsey and the World Bank. Here's the engineering estimate from the World Bank. The World Bank said that old refrigerators use 850 kilowatt hours per year and new refrigerators use 369 kilowatt hours per year for a savings of 481 kilowatt hours per year. This same uh, study predicted that the air conditioning replacement would save 1200 kilowatt hours per year. When we, look at, when we look at the data, here's what we find. So here's an event study for households who replace their refrigerators. This is a classic event study. So zero, think of zero, zero is when households replace their, their refrigerator. And we go back 12 months and then go forward 12 months. And so what you see is that in the 12 months leading up to refrigerator replacement, there's essentially flat electricity consumption. Nothing changes. Then right around the time of replacement, consumption falls by 10 kilowatt hours per month. And then, it and then it pretty much levels off. So this is a real savings, but it's actually only one quarter of what was predicted by the World Bank. Perhaps more interesting, when we go to look at the estimates by month, here's what we see. So the left panel is refrigerators. And you see if you, if you compare July to July or November to November or March to March, you basically get the same answer. You save 10 kilowatt hours per month. But when you look at the guys who replace their air conditioners, there's a, there's a distinct seasonal pattern. It looks like during winter month, there's essentially no response or even some electricity savings. But during the summer months, July, August, September, and October, there are large, large and statistically significant increases in electricity consumption. So what the heck is going on here? Uh, we, think there, we think there's a couple of things going on here. Um, first is it looks like air conditioning utilization increased. That's what that seasonal pattern tells us. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, these, the new air conditioners were cheaper to operate. They were also just better devices. They were quieter. They operated at different, sp uh, different speeds so you could run it at night without having it turn on and off uh, cycle throughout the night. Uh, we think that's a big part of it. But, it. but it can't, for example, explain why the refrigerator results are only a quarter of what the World Bank predicted. So we think there's some other things. The newer appliances tended to be larger and have more features. This we've seen for decades, right? People continue to get larger and larger appliances with more and more features. I love that my refrigerator has through the door ice and water. I use that feature every day. But I also know that, that that's using about 80 kilowatt hours a year in electricity. That, that consumes a lot of electricity. And so the, the extent that this has continued to ramp up, it's going it's, it's to mean that you're not going to reach the, in, the engineering estimates from McKinsey for savings. Uh, lastly, the old appliances tended to be close to the minimum age threshold. So to participate in the program, it had to be a 10-year-old appliance. And we actually find that about half of the appliances are either 10, 11, or 12 years old. So the program didn't, wasn't very effective at going out and grabbing those 20-year-old, 30-year-old appliances. OK. Let me now turn from evidence to action. Let me just wrap up and provide a couple of, couple of ideas. Um, we think this is some pretty direct evidence on, on uh, on the effect of energy efficiency subsidies. Surprisingly, there's very little evidence on this kind of, this, this kind of stuff. On participation, our, our bottom line is that we're finding that most households would have participated for, with, even for much smaller subsidies. 
and so that it would have been much more cost effective to use smaller subsidies. The big subsidies are just not cost effective. In terms of the savings, we're finding the refrigerators do save electricity, but much less than predicted by the World Bank, and that the air conditioning program appears to have actually increased electricity consumption. It may be that this air conditioner replacement route is just not a good energy conservation policy. Uh, moreover, it makes me think of standards, which have been used for a long time, both in the U.S. and Mexico, with, we think, a lot of success, although we need more research on that, too. Uh, moreover, I, th I think this, and I think I, I think I can kind of speak for a lot of the panels today, that, that uh, we, I feel like we've learned a lot with some of this stuff, uh, but th th I think we've also underscored an urgent need for more research. So on the energy efficiency side, I would like to know uh, about energy efficient lighting. I'd like to know more about rapidly changing technologies. Refrigerator technology is not changing that fast. Uh, and so it would be interesting to look at different technologies. I'd also like to get into different forms of deployment. What about standards versus subsidies, for example? High quality micro data is critical for this. So you've got to collect data and you've got to make it publicly available. I think this is a bigger deal on some of the energy side than some of, the, some of this other stuff where it's based on RCTs. Uh, but this seems like a no-brainer. It seems obvious that you would want to col collect and disseminate this data. But most energy efficiency programs today are not getting evaluated, either because the data is not collected or because the data is not shared. Utilities are, are famous for not wanting to share their data. I mean, the, the main complaint you get is that uh, we're concerned about customer, customer privacy. Yeah, I think that's a pretty weak argument uh, today. Um, my colleagues in the economics department for decades have been anal analyzing um, very sensitive earnings records, uh, other, form, other sources of microdata that are much more confidential than energy consumption. And we've, we've learned how to strip identifying information off these data sets in a way that eliminates those kind of privacy concerns. So you've got to turn over the data. One of my favorite lines, uh, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. Uh, there's a whole row of Berkeley grad students back there who would love to get data and use their talent and experience to evaluate these kind of programs. Let's take a, pri let's take a turn from the private sector here, where uh, companies like Google don't make a move uh, if they can't collect data on it and, rigor and analyze it rigorously. We should be doing the same thing. We should do it for Prop 39 that Tom mentioned in the lunch. We should be doing it for all, the, all these, po the, these policies. It matters, a l it matters more because these are public funds. And it matters even more in developing country context where those, those funds are so, so precious. Thank you. Did you calculate the final cost per reduced ton of emissions of the program? Yeah, um, depending on what assumptions you make, you get 500 to $1,000 per, per ton of CO2. So just to put that in a little bit of context for folks, that's uh, you know, the, in, in what's, what's the ETS trading uh, at now? Three dollars per ton. That's not a, that's not a perfect compare. That's actually not a perfect comparison because one's a measure. Uh, that's not a, it's not a perfect comparison. But we're finding that. For, I mean, I, I think, I think the bottom line from this, and I think what, what could be taken away from this, is this, is that the program just is not as cost effective as we expected it to be. Um, Any other questions? Please raise your hand up high. Uh, just a question about standards and the replacement program. Uh, you mentioned that there are s standards programs with respect to these appliances in Mexico. I would assume for this to be a cost-effective policy for replacement, it would need to be complemented by a, by a standard. D does your data hold up where there's a standard in place for the efficiency of those new appliances? Is that what's happening, or is there no standard for these appliances that are replacing the old ones? you want to take a step in? Well, the, so the exciting news is it looks like, so Mexico for, for over a decade has harmonized their appliance efficiency standards, standards with the U.S. And they were, we, they were, it was looking like they weren't going to adopt the 2014 refrigerator standard, but it looks like they will now, which is really, which I, I, think, is, uh, I think is good news. Um, uh, I think this is really one of the missed opportunities with this program, that it didn't push, push that frontier more. You could have required that the new appliance exceed the energy efficiency standard by 40%. Uh, when we run that through, through the, when we run the numbers on that, it still it doesn't turn this into a massively cost-effective program, but it, it would have been a lot better. I think we have one last question over here. So the air conditioning 
result is interesting because, you know, as you say, you know, giving people newer air conditioners increases consumption. And air conditions also seem, particularly in hot places, one of those things that some people argue is actually a bad thing, that we shouldn't be encouraging the use of air conditioning. We should instead be encouraging use of, you know, more natural cooling mechanisms, different kinds of building architectures. Have there been analyses in the kind of context of which kind of appliances we should be offering these things to in terms of just general behavioral pushes? Like, we don't want people to use ACs. We want them to buy fans or, you know, give subsidies for architectural changes to their houses, painting the roofs, those kinds of things that reduce, you know, reduce energy consumption um, in ways that are kind of more sustainable in that sense. I mean, it, it is striking, right? I think you can run 40 fans for what it takes to one, run one room air conditioner. So particularly, in Mex Mexico has very uh, uh, dependable power, but in other parts of the world where you really are up against blackouts, they're, they're, they're you know, basically electricity not priced, uh, even, wor even worse than it is in Mexico. Uh, I, I think there's more of that. I mean, uh, I, I think one of the things you saw with, this, with air conditioning is the, utiliza is the utilization. And th this, what's talked about in a lot of circles, is the rebound effect. And I think on, on balance, if you had the choice in appliances between subsidizing an appliance where there was not much, uh, not much of a rebound effect like a refrigerator, that may be a better bet than, than something like an air conditioner. Uh, broader, you know, I, I'd actually, can I just take this opportunity just at the end and go back to carbon tax, carbon tax, carbon tax, right? Uh, pricing the bad as opposed to subsidizing the good would, would, would induce all these behaviors you're talking about. <laughs>